Allow patients to escape with the slightest attack of surgery your skill can supply. This aphorism of Robert Tuttle Morris, the prominent 20th century New York surgeon, expresses so aptly the principle of gentleness to tissue. What effect does surgical technique have on wound healing? What are some of the ways the surgeon can let the patient escape with the slightest attack? Repair is the bedrock on which surgery is founded. It is such a fundamental part of biology that most surgeons accept it as inevitable, a process which will or will not occur, and having occurred will be normal, a single immutable sequence. However, even a superficial reading of surgical history reveals that some of the most fundamental surgical advances have occurred as a result of sudden new insights into the reparative mechanism. Repair is not simply the surgeon's friend, it is his ally, it is his lifeline. Unless the surgeon arranges his priorities to aid repair and mobilize resistance to infection, he will be little more than a surgeon of the last century who somehow found his way into a modern operating room. Repair begins with the injury, and its rate is profoundly influenced by the type of injury. In the operating room, the injury is caused by the incision, the cautery, the clamp, and other instruments. Whether the injury is small or large, reparative processes are basically similar. To explain the healing process, we shall look at one inner face of a wound with the aid of a set of idealized drawings. The first shows the wound a few hours after it has been made. Blood vessels have thrombosed with a plug of platelets and red cells. An inflammatory exudate of lymphocytes and polymorphonuclear leukocytes has appeared. One polymorph is shown ingesting a bacterium in the wound space, thus demonstrating its major function of resisting infection and removing injured tissue. This is the wound at three to four days. Macrophages have begun to appear. Fibroblasts, which will eventually provide the fiber, collagen, to glue the wound together, have begun to multiply from their resting position, usually in the adventitia of local blood vessels. Macrophages, or monocytes, have become the predominant inflammatory cell. They also ingest bacteria, fibrin, and other substances. The act of ingestion seems to stimulate the macrophages to produce chemical signals, which cause multiplication of fibroblasts and migration of budding capillary endothelial cells to form arcs of new vessels. Of all the inflammatory cells, the macrophage is the only one which stimulates the healing process itself. At about one week, fibroblasts are the dominant cell. The wound has grown upward because new vessels have been formed, allowing the macrophages and fibroblasts to migrate into the wound space. New collagen serves as a framework for further growth, supporting the fragile new vessels as blood flow begins in them, and eventually fusing the wound edges together. Remember, this diagram shows only one side of a wound. A primarily closed wound, one sutured carefully, shortly after it was made, so that this side of the wound, for instance, would join the other side, would have fused together by this time, and some circulation might have formed across the interface. The last diagram shows our wound as if it were healing secondarily, a granulating wound 10 days or older. Fibroblasts are making collagen gel, through which endothelial cells are tunneling with the aid of collagenase to form arcs of new blood vessels. The advancing vascular supply is now made up of totally new vessels grown from the stem vessels, 
which in turn have been left behind. The diagram shows the ghosts of old vessels which have dropped out in the rear of the wound module where they are no longer necessary. The fibroblasts in this region, their job finished, are beginning to disappear. As the wound ages, the vasculature becomes excessive due to decreased metabolic demand. Wound vessels atrophy. Fibroblasts finish depositing collagen and remodeling it, and the wound becomes quiescent over a period of 6 to 12 months. The unit of wound healing defined by this diagram will move forward until it is joined from the other side of the wound by a similar unit, or until it is covered by new epithelium. Collagen is being lysed from the wound at the same time it is being deposited. Healing is a race between tissue deposition and tissue lysis. New scar collagen is weak. These scanning electron microscope photos show first the normal dermal collagen. Note the thickness and highly organized fibers and fibrils. The second picture is of collagen from a young wound only a few weeks old. Hardly any fibers as such are visible. The collagen is a gel. The last view shows a remodeled wound many months old. The fibers are highly cross-linked but small. This scar is more brittle than normal tissue. Epithelization begins a few hours after injury when basal cells become rounder and mitoses appear. New cells migrate across the wound seeking a plane favorable to their movement and nutrition. In this wound, protected from dehydration with a plastic sheet, the plane is on the surface. The epithelial cells eventually form a fragile one or two cell thick layer. These cells will soon begin to multiply again, forming a thicker, more complete epithelial barrier with a full complement of cells. Yet, the end result is a thin epithelium without appendages or papillae. If the wound is allowed to dry and an eschar forms, the epithelial cells must burrow beneath the eschar to find nutrition. This is a slower and more energy consuming process than surface epithelization on a well protected wound. Vascular supply is fundamental to wound healing. Without vascular supply, injured tissue is helpless. Every surgeon knows that a wound in an ischemic extremity will not heal and will become infected. We can study vascularization microscopically in a rabbit ear chamber. The wound is a hole in a rabbit's ear sandwiched between plastic and glass membranes. A thin layer of regenerative tissue grows across the hole and between the membranes, allowing microscopic observation of the repair process. A week after wounding, growing, functioning capillary buds and loops already supply the nutrition necessary for the advancing wound edge. The new vessels are extremely sensitive to catecholamines. Watch the vessels of this rabbit ear wound while a vasoconstrictor epinephrine is injected into the bloodstream. Here the response is speeded to three times normal by time-lapse photography. The profound changes are made immediately obvious. Flow soon returns after injection of a vasoconstrictor, but the vasoconstriction of hypovolemia persists until the volume deficit is restored. In vasoconstriction due to hypovolemia or shock, the new tissue may even become anoxic and the cells can degenerate. The wound module may be destroyed and must reassemble before it can again proceed. In severe hypovolemia, collagen synthesis stops. Polymorphs deprived of their oxygen supply lose about half of their killing capacity for most wound infecting organisms. Actual measurements of the partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, have been made in these wounds. The PO2 is highest near the blood vessels and lower between them. 
At the advancing edge, however, over the macrophage layer, PO2 falls almost to zero. The wound cells have literally run out of oxygen at their furthest excursion into the tissue defect. Without atmospheric oxygen, collagen synthesis slows to zero. If more oxygen is made available, the wound edge advances faster. If the supply is restricted, the healing process will slow and may even stop. We now turn to another wound model, an incision in a neovascularized cornea of a rabbit. The vascularization of the cornea was induced by injecting isolated wound macrophages into a healthy cornea. Lymphocytes and polymorphs can be injected in a similar manner without causing a visible change. This is the wound directly after incision through the cornea. Vasospasm and coagulation soon stop the hemorrhage. Flow is lost in these vessels for several millimeters back from the wound edge. The incision is now sutured using 10-O ophthalmic nylon sutures. The suture and its needle are barely visible to the unaided eye. But note how gross they seem when compared with the tissue which is being repaired. Think now of the usual surgical instruments you use. They are necessary, but one should always remember the damage they do. Note how closely the ends of the blood vessels are approximated. This is the same wound only five days later. Because it has been closed so gently and approximated so accurately, one can already demonstrate restored circulation through the previously divided vessels. This is the ideal, the fastest reaction and repair which follows modern surgical operations. What can the surgeon do to approach the results shown here? How can he aid wounds to restore tissue continuity and resist infection? First, the incision can be made boldly with one stroke of the knife dividing tissue in only one place, as opposed to hacking or even gentle brushing strokes, which inevitably leave islands of poorly perfused tissue. Second, hemostasis can be allowed to occur naturally whenever possible. When sutures or ligatures are necessary, use as fine a material as possible, as gently and accurately as possible. Electric cautery must be used sparingly. Note the damage an electric cautery can do. Even this, the most precise available cautery, produces a dramatic necrosis under magnification. Four days later, this cauterized wound has become visibly infected. Note how new vessels have been stimulated, but the result is not surgically acceptable. Retraction should be gentle. Self-retaining retractors should be avoided or used without excessive tension and released from time to time to restore circulation beneath their pressure points. It is not at all unusual to see a wound infection confined to the place where the maximum tension of a retractor was maintained for hours at a time. Prevent the wound from drying. Desiccation increases the damage made by the knife. Closure techniques should be gentle. The major cause of dehiscence in abdominal wounds is simply that sutures have been tied too tightly, have strangulated the local circulation, and have cut through tissue, thus allowing the wound to fall apart. Collagen lysis is most active within five millimeters of the wound edge. Therefore, for greatest security, sutures should be placed more than five millimeters from the wound edge, where tough connective tissue will hold the sutures as long as necessary. Porous multifilament sutures can be avoided. Fluids and bacteria travel by capillarity down such sutures into the wound space. Either subcuticular sutures or skin tapes are preferable to multifilament sutures. This wound was closed half by sutures and half by tape. 
Note the inflammation in the suture tracks in contrast to the side closed with tapes. Numerous studies have demonstrated that contaminated wounds closed with tapes become infected significantly less frequently than those closed with sutures. The better the condition of the patient, the better the condition of the wound. A little hypovolemia, a little hypoxia, a little malnutrition, a little injury, a little pressure, a little anti-inflammatory steroid, each takes its toll, and the sum total can be surgical disaster. If all goes well, if the surgeon applies his technical skills boldly and gently, if he uses the fewest possible clamps, the gentlest retractors, if he protects the wound from drying, if he maintains the circulatory and pulmonary physiology of his patient, he can approach the ideal healing shown in our wound model. The closer he can approach the ideal, the wider are the surgical horizons open to him. The clinical challenge is that studies of the events which follow injury now put a major responsibility clearly on the surgeon. Well-made wounds in well-attended patients will heal well.